everybody and welcome to the modernist guide uh today we're talking about squid game which wasn't really planning on talking about a tv series so fast but i realize it's already like a month maybe two behind anyways so if people will still care enough uh just do it now and get it out of the way but also i guess it's pretty ironic to try to be self-made or make a name for yourself or DIY anything by trying to keep up with the trends, keep up with what's popular. And to do that currently is to talk about a show that is about the bullshit of capitalism and how you have to sacrifice a lot to get ahead just a little bit or maybe just completely fail anyways, no matter how hard you try. Korea right now is just in a resurgence of both anti-capitalist and just like our society is wrong right now kind of situation. And a lot of Westernites are suddenly, you know, caring because that's how a lot of people feel in America or, you know, parts of Europe. Um, I'm not exactly sure how much bigger of a deal it is anywhere besides knowing that it was huge for America. It was huge for Korea. Um, but I think the big issue is that it keeps happening. We can talk about Parasite by Bong Joon-ho all day. Almost all of his films are social commentary, and he's really good. You should just watch anything by Bong Joon-ho. It doesn't really matter. Snowpiercer is a huge comment on the caste system and classism in society and how wealthy versus poor are in a very extreme allegory, but to pretend like, <laughs> I don't know, Jeff Bezos just went to space, so maybe he would actually build a train to go around the world to house only a thousand people. And then, even though they're the last humans alive, still figure out how to make, like, a bunch of them super poor workers with bad living conditions. Jeffrey, Jeffrey Bezos. Come on, Jeffrey, you can do it. Pave the way, put your back into it. That's the problem with capitalism that people see that people are looking at uh parasite was just about a bunch of people who seemed like you know dirty con people who didn't live well but it's because they never really got a chance to circumstances constantly kept in their way that's what the whole flood scene was and you know what the meme is now about being blessed for the rain and it's goes over so many people's heads or people who are pretending to so they can keep their place in society and it's all very clear if you just look at making fun of rich people and you can pretend like communism is secretly that kind of thing as well but it's not um not actual communism what people fight for what people talk about marxism in general all of that is not even trying to make people equal as much as everyone having equal accessibility to things. That's what people don't understand. So to all the idiots out there, I'm not going to name names, start fights with drones who have millions of followers. It's not about communism. It's not about communism. If you think that Squid Game is about communism, then you are pushing an agenda even harder than the guy who wrote it when he was in huge financial debt in 2008. Boing Tong Yuk, and hopefully I got that close. I hate the idea of just butchering people's names because I can't pronounce it. People should know his name. He's probably going to go on to do a lot of great things. And like Korean cinema right now is, is huge. It's not just uh, Bong Joon-ho. Uh, one of my favorite films last year, Space Sweepers, also on Netflix, secretly is about how capitalism screws everything up. It also has a billionaire in space. Jeffrey Bezos. Every analysis of Squid Game that I've seen is like almost right and you know right enough because you can interpret it any way you want except for the complete wrong way because even if you want to interpret interpret it as a allegory for something that's not anti-capitalist it's about a bunch of people who are super down on their luck in lots of different ways who are in a lot of debt who decide dying for money is the only real solution they have 
I'm gonna uh, just name off the characters one by one and like the situations they're in and how they handle things. But I'm gonna use their numbers after a while, after their first uh, introduction, so I'm not just constantly butchering their names. The main guy, San Jun, uh, number four, five, six. He's just a gambler and a lot of debt and a lot of problems. He's both a self insert of the writer director and uh, Kaiji from anime and manga series, which is literally just a guy with such a thrill and problem with gambling that he will risk literally limbs and he can't help himself. And it's an addiction. It's also a commentary on capitalism, but I think not as like blunt and forward as people want to believe. Then you have his um, childhood friend, uh, Chung Sang Woo, who is number 218, financial guy and a lot of debt. He screwed up. I think he was either a lawyer or was just like a, a Korean version of Wall Street kind of guy. But he was in just so much debt that even his mother didn't know. And she started to suffer for it. So his intention seems good if it's like to help his mother too. But, you know, he drastically goes down super fast. And then there's a woman who is actually... A North Korean defector she escaped she went to South Korea and her the symbolism for her is pretty important uh Gan Sebak number 67 basically is asked at one point what's worse North or South Korea and she's like well <laughs> they both suck in their own ways and that you could maybe pretend that it's a commentary on uh communism but like communism as what it was written down as to be is not what it is anywhere not Back in Stalin, Russia, not in uh, Mao, China, not in current North Korea. That's not communism. That's fascism with a communist name that takes some communist ideas, but they only really use it for the upper class. It's not used for the entire country. And that is something people completely ignore or blindly uh, look past or have no clue because no one will just tell them that that's the problem. We have everybody's favorites, which is uh, the old man, Il Nam, number one, and Ali, number 199. Ali is fantastic, and he is, I think, the real audience surrogate of someone who just actually wants to do the right thing or believe if you work hard enough, you'll get somewhere, and he gets fucked over. Il Nam, I thought was going to be a boomer allegory, but he turned out to just be... Um, there must be like a much bigger deal with how older people are treated in Korea specifically and how they're just kind of left to die by the wayside eventually. And we had some of that being accused here in America during the COVID pandemic. Not every old person is selfish and hateful, but there is this mentality of like, if you don't care about the young people at all, then why do we need to take care of old people? And I think that sentiment uh, can be shown either way. And then also, um, number one just kind of has different weird flashes. Like, there's a meme, you know, of that smile now. And it's like, just feeling the rush again of maybe having a chance at something. And it's a really good way to, like, compare capitalism to gambling. The final two we have is uh, Han Myun and uh, Dak Suk. Dak Suk is 101, Han Myun is 212. And... Mian's actually kind of one of my favorite characters because she's crazy. But, like, in a very silly, cartoonish way. But also, I think she represents, like, maybe negative female stereotypes uh, in what a male-dominated capitalist society does, supposedly. Um, and it's what women have to resort to to get even a little bit ahead or even treated equal. Because um, we all see what happens to women in the show very quickly and they're just I think it's a very good example of you are probably going to lose but at least lose with somebody take someone down with you I think she's a very good allegory for that there's also Jung Ho the cop and he's I don't know how to think about him because where we are right now as a, as a world society because there's been world protests against police brutality and a lot of people resent the idea of any cop being remotely good but i think 
that's a good thing with him because ultimately and man i so bad at making videos i need to like explain that there's spoilers at the beginning right um the, the non-specific spoiler uh review mostly uh it's also been a couple of months anyone who's gonna look up squid game reviews probably have already seen it but you know going in a rant mode my bad i think the idea of he is a good cop and he tries to do the good cop thing and it ultimately you know looks like he dies for it supposedly is just another allegory that no matter how good you try to be or how hard you fight the system even when you have an upper leg as being some form of authority that can have maybe some dichotomy of power you could still fail miserably or die for it so i think the big question is though is why is squid game such a big deal because we've had this before right we had parasite only a few years ago as far as like if you just wanted to say a specifically korean film screaming to you that being rich is bad and you shouldn't blame people in dire needs for the things they do to try to get ahead but then a lot of people want to pretend to be smart and go further and be like you know hunger games or battle royale which the creator has said that they were direct inspirations so they're there but you can go even further i think it's funny some people were like oh running man but you know there's a book from 1924 called the most dangerous game and it's literally about a rich old man who used to do safaris and he got tired of it and he owns an island and people who shipwreck there he treats well for a minute and then he sends them off and he tries to hunt them because he has gotten bored with killing tigers and elephants so he's decided that the best he can do now is to hunt humans and that's why he has the island like it's it's a direct correlation it's been around for a hundred years and I'm not sure if the author at the time meant for it to be anti-capitalist. Capitalism was like the best it could possibly be. So maybe he was super still anti-rich in the mid-20s. But, um, you know, Greg Gatsby as well is, you can argue, very anti-capitalist because it's like all the money in the world and you'll still die and nothing will be important at all. And that That's the thing is, I think finally in the past 40 years or so maybe 20 anti-capitalism is not such a dirty word and we're more reasonably past the red scare then we should be way further past it but we're not still people act like now socialism is a dirty word which is a mix between capitalism and communism that's just something that uh conservatives and people who don't want things to change argue is that any monochrome of change is bad but we have to progress forward and so this argument is now at least a hundred years old there could be something older than most dangerous game but at least a hundred years old where the richard board and they have nothing better to do than to watch poor misfortunate people die or be killed one way or another and i don't know how you can argue any more than that on the commentary for squid game specifically than the fact that there's about five old white dudes in golden animal helmets watching the like top 10 finalists die in the game right before the final it's like the semi-final game it's the fifth game and it goes down to three people and no one knows that they're there no one knows that these super rich guys that can't be bothered by anything are watching them die for sport and for entertainment. I'm pretty sure they're called the 1%. <laughs> Maybe not in the actual show, but that's directly what that is. But I think um, the best like use of the metaphor that it is all about capitalism isn't even that they're all there fighting each other over money or anything like that. It's actually game four. The marble game and that's because you're allowed to change the game at any point um, that's exactly what uh, 101 does because he starts to lose so he changes the game and he gets to win now and the guy who is winning is now dead I think a very interesting commentary is 212 
she didn't get a partner. You had to have a partner for the game, and they figured she was going to get killed. And a lot of people pointed this out as a mistake, but I think it's actually a really clever uh, commentary on the fact that, like, if you don't play the game, you can't die. <laughs> it's not a perfect allegory. It's not a, a perfect statement because, like, we all have to, like, play to win money one way or another, no matter what the work is. That's a problem with capitalism. But then 218 and 199 is another great example because he's also losing. 218 is. But he, allegedly, he believes that his need is greater. Even though 199 Ali, he is a migrant worker. He has a, I think it's wife and kid or sister. I can't remember the subtitle. Um, but he has people to depend on him. And he lost his job, and then he got angry and he made things worse. So he had to go back. And he still failed miserably because he trusted people, because he was still a good person. He didn't need to save 456, and a lot of people think that that was also like a plot problem. But it's supposed to show that if you're nice and you let people get ahead of you, or if you help other people, that doesn't always mean that they'll help you back, or can help you back, or want to, or they'll deceive you. And that's how you lose, too. And that's how you die. So, it's... And that's not necessarily the um, overly negative and hateful comment that you shouldn't help people. It's trying to show the ruthlessness of what is called competition in capitalism. You compete... And there's not enough spots. So that means a lot of people believe they have to be ruthless and they have to undermine and undercut people. Especially people who think that if they work together, they can succeed. Because that's supposed to be the communist idea. Is that if you work together, you succeed. Better than if you uh, cut everybody at the knees. And a lot of people link that to fascism because one of the main fascist ideas is everybody together is strong and you can't break a bundle of sticks but that is more like a group of people under one person it's the same thing for like monarchies of any kind for royalty um cults and stuff i also think one of the biggest uh appeals for a lot of people was that at the beginning they got to leave after witnessing all the horror of these people dying like i think it was almost 500 people and like over half died in the first game because it was such an easy way to cull people out initially and they voted and they got out and that was great for a second it's this weird confusion of like oh you can leave and you can you know it, this is fair but it's actually not because then people went back to the real world and they realized oh i still have the same problems i'm still poor I still don't have another better option than all that money. I'm still super fucked, so I have to go back. I have to. But now I know what I'm getting into, so I can be more prepared, right? And that is the illusion of choice that uh, is presented in the story, but also in capitalism. Because ultimately, who gets to decide your fate? Is it you, or is it your manager, or your boss, or the person who hires you, or just somebody with just slightly more power than you? who also answers to someone slightly more powerful than them, and it keeps going up and up until someone so powerful who can still affect your job doesn't actually, like, know who you are. I think that's a, a good way to look at the workers who are faceless and just have the symbols, and you don't know who any of them are, because they know all the secrets, and they know all the bad things that are going to happen, but they're faceless. They mean nothing. They are nobody. And that's how you keep them in line. I don't really know what to say about the ending. I saw a lot of people thought that it was bad. And I'm not sure which part. is it, Was it the big reveal of who was behind the game and ran it all? And how people thought that that didn't make sense. That he could have been behind it. Or the fact that he like died as soon after anyways. Or was it the part where a uh, dude just main guy um sanjun just like dyed his hair red looks really weird about to go see his daughter didn't really use all the money he won 
which is crazy, and gave it to 67's brother instead, little brother, because uh, he's, you know, super orphan at this point. His parents were dead from trying to escape Korea, and now she's gone. But he's by himself. And he, like, gave all the money to her. But he's going to go see his daughter. Then he decides not to because he wants to stop the game from happening. Yeah, that's weird. It feels kind of taken e a little bit, where it's like, I'm going to stop you and whatever. But I don't know. I think there was a, an effort to force the idea that underneath all this, even though we compete in the society that we're in, even though we work um, and watch people die and keep going, or, you know, we just hear about workers who die, who die on shift, but we still go to work too, those kind of things. We still try to believe there's some kind of good. And that soap opera E and sappy as it was, that the main bad guy dies on Christmas Eve midnight, like it's the 24th, and at midnight he dies, and the homeless man that he bet outside would just stay there till midnight suddenly gets help. Um, that obnoxious poetry, very forced, and probably the silliest thing out of the whole show, which is saying something, is still, it's not supposed to be taken so literally as it's just like, Maybe we should help homeless people. Maybe we should try a little bit of something. And I think it was specifically that that convinced 456 to not see his daughter, which everyone says made him a bad dad. He was kind of already a bad dad, um, mostly by his impulses and circumstances he couldn't control. But now he thinks that, you know, she's probably going to do great without him. So he, the real good he can do is to try to stop the bullshit of the game. He's trying to end capitalism. That's like, he's literally like, I'm going to stop capitalism once and for all, and this time it's personal. And it's hilarious in that regard. But I I really like that about Korean cinema in general. Um, no matter how deep and serious it is, there's another, like, levity trying to be uplifting and positive, even though there's so much bullshit to swim through. Ultimately, I think this is a very necessary um, critique that we need, like, right now, above all else. And Korea's not afraid to do it. And they've kind of been doing it for 10 years. And that th this huge wave of uh, America specifically, but again, Western Knights in general, kind of paying attention to Korea and what they have to say about uh, society and industry and capitalism, kind of stems from Gangnam Style by Psy. Because 2012, that amazingly goofy fucking horsey dance that made over 8 million single sales by a like dance comedy singer was about the Gangnam District in Seoul which is where all the shitty rich people live and that has trickled down to this huge like capitalist concept of oh they like all this Korean stuff. Let's give all the white people in power in America exposure to all this Korean stuff. That is also kind of commentating about how capitalism is bad. It's an aura of Boris, really, snake eating its tail. And who knows if we're going to come out on the other side at all. We're just going to eat ourselves into oblivion, which is probably ultimately what capitalism is, is that you keep going until there is no more. I think that's all I really have to say is that this whole like uh, capitalism forces survival in the most weird and strange of ways that sacrifice and risk people's lives and we all pretend it doesn't and we make memes on the internet about it to make ourselves feel better and then the message gets completely lost and then we're just back where we started. Uh, but that's just how it's going to be unless actual people somehow who care get in charge of things and can change things and it's still such a long road ahead of us no matter what the outcome is so you know squid game has funko pops now and <laughs> uh maybe there's a sequel and a lot of people are already talking about what's the next squid game and they're also very specifically looking at korea um they just assume south korean cinema is just this wild fascinating thing that you know it it they're making up mysticism, it feels like. Um, but man, Korean cinema is really good. And so is Japanese cinema. And so is uh, Indonesia and Taiwanese cinema. 
uh, there's so much stuff on Netflix specifically from all of those countries. And there's even a couple of films from China that seem to be uh, challenging authority. But I know a lot of it is also just uh, propaganda about how great uh, the Chinese military is. So you have to pick and choose. But the East seems to really, really want to let people know that society is crumbling and that maybe we should start doing something about it. So that's really it. You should definitely watch it or binge it. I would binge it, honestly. So yeah, that's all this time. And like, subscribe. I hope to see a lot of people grow to like the channel, and we'll see where we go. And have a good night.